Uh, this is uh, uh, Thursday. We're at Institute for Policy Studies. It's March 19th, uh, uh, 2015. I'm Mike Tabor, one of the, the collective members of the Studies of the 60s and 70s project. This is Rabbi Harold White. We're talking about Harold's activities, mostly as it involved Jews for Urban Justice, a radical to slash revolutionary group in the 60s and 70s that eventually merged into Verbrangen uh, in the early 1970s. So, uh, Harold, can you briefly give us um, a biographical background? Where'd you grow up? Uh, what made you become a rabbi? And uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, I grew up in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, attended high school, public school there. Then went on to Wesleyan University um, in Middletown, Connecticut which had a very small Jewish population at the time. Thought I wanted to become a psychiatrist. Decided I needed practicum, so I worked at a state hospital. Then you could get away with saying it was a state hospital for the insane. It was when Ken Casey wrote uh, One Flew Over a Cuckoo's Nest. And my job was to wheel patients in and out of shock treatments. And I saw what was happening. They were being electrocuted. I saw the frontal lobotomies and all those things, and I decided I didn't want to become a psychiatrist. So, at that point, I thought about the possibilities of bringing peace and love through religion. And I was always involved in Jewish religious life, spiritual life. And it was that episode uh, at uh, Westland which made me turn towards the Rabbitine, which was no surprise to me was a surprise to my family when I told them I wanted to become a rabbi. They said, why? And I said, well, I would think you'd be pleased. Well, they weren't because they had been involved in synagogue life and they knew how synagogues had a tendency to mistreat their rabbis. And I said, well, because I want to save the world. And my father and mother said to me, if you want to save the world, go into the family business, make a lot of money, become president, be an eye Jewish appeal, and then you'll, then, then you'll do it. You know what? I think I've helped individuals. I haven't saved the world. But that gives you some background. When did you learn about Jews for Urban Justice? Uh, I learned about JUJ uh, in Ann Arbor. I was a rabbi in Ann Arbor for, 60, for six years, between 62 and 68. And in Ann Arbor, I was very involved in uh, civic life. I was on the uh, Ann Arbor City Council. I organized a uh, protest. Uh, in favor, actually, of open housing, uh, and uh, was the chair of the Ann Arbor Washington Conference on Religion and Race, and the Ann Arbor Conference on Religion and Peace. So I was involved, very involved in the civil rights movement, and very involved in the peace movement. Now, I used to come to Washington frequently on peace marches. It was not one of my favorite places. In fact, it was the home of the Pentagon. I could never imagine myself coming here. Uh, and what happened uh, was that um, Max Tickton and, uh, contacted me. He was in Chicago at the time. And uh, I got to know Max via the mail. There was no email at the time. And I began to develop an interest uh, in Hillel. Thought that I would like maybe to work with students. Because I was working with students uh, at uh, uh, Michigan. But I didn't want to come to Washington if there was nothing for me to do because I had an active presence in Ann Arbor with civil rights and peace movement. What year is it? Uh, 1960, from about 1964 uh, to, uh, I knew Tom Hayden uh, when he was the editor of the Michigan Daily. So I was, very, I was really very involved then. And uh, I heard about J.U.J. And really, J.U.J., the presence of J.U.J. in Washington influenced me to come to Washington because I knew I would never have come to Washington uh, if, there weren't, if it weren't for an organization of this nature. My experience with Washington on the peace marches and the march on poverty, etc., was that there was little to no Jewish involvement. When I came, I slept on the floor of the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church. I didn't see local rabbis there. Mm -hmm. I saw rabbis from elsewhere, but not local rabbis. So that influenced me a great deal. You know, when uh, uh, we were not able to relate to the Jewish community, uh, 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 so we started in 1966, and the thought of a rabbi being involved was 
virtually impossible then. Uh, so do you remember when, when you came here, when you joined, what did you immediately get involved in with the group? The first thing I got involved with was early on uh, was the Great Boycott. And I remember that very vividly uh, because I made up my mind that I would go to see Gedalia Cohn, who was the, he wasn't the president of, of Giant Food, uh, but the Cohn family owned half the organization, and Joe Danzansky was the CEO. And so I went to see him, and uh, I knew that I had to give him a Jewish argument uh, in relation to the Great Boycott. And I mentioned to him Oshek. Oshek is a Talmudic principle which states that anything, any food subject, substance that's used for oppression is immediately trafe. And I talked to him about the grapes, and I talked to him about Oshek. He immediately got on the phone and called his son and said, take the grapes off the, uh, off the counters. And I felt very, very proud of that. Uh, but that, that was... That was the way, but initially um, we contacted you because uh, we'd heard about this concept of Oshek, approached the Massachusetts Board of Rabbis for a ruling on it. They declared the grapes to be unkosher. This is, this is my memory at, at the time. And we needed, our action was going to be pouring blood on grapes at Right, time. yes. And you um, volunteered to be a part of that and to say the appropriate prayer, whatever it was, to say Well, Mr. Grapes. Cohn did not like that idea. But, but, we had he, a but he argued on the basis of Oshek. He was a Talmudic scholar. Well, we, uh, we were enjoined from doing that. But you were willing to come with us. Yes. That's what I remember. Um, so specific, oh, so I, I, I want to ask you, but maybe it's, for, it's best to get into some of the things you were involved in. You, you taught Jewish classes. Yes, I had. Um, and, you, and it was part of our outreach uh, in the 60s. It was unusual in that at that point there were no alternative groups sponsoring, especially on the left, Jewish-oriented classes. Well, for one thing, I was uh, centrally located. I had a large Victorian house on Q Street, and it was, it was large, and I was in the center of action. At that time, DuPont Circle was very marginal. I mean, I would constantly have alcoholics and drug addicts on my stoop. Uh, and so I was one of the few rabbis really living in the city, because most of them were living outside of the city, but not in the DuPont Circle area. So I had a class, and it met every week, and we uh, did many, many things. Um, the first, we studied the prophets. We studied the concept of the uh, prophetic uh, idea of justice, as people who were people of action, people who demonstrated. I remember talking about Jeremiah, who wanted to uh, illustrate the uh, oppression of King Joachim, and he took a yoke of oxen and put it on his shoulders and walked around the streets of Jerusalem. Everyone was very impressed by that. Uh, and then I taught to, a course on Talmudic ethics uh, and about, and also a course on a, a, a Jewish view, a Talmudic view of the just war. So we got into all these things, and I dare say, uh, people came, so the same people came every week, and other people uh, began to come. That class lasted for at least two years. Uh, and uh, do you remember how many people, but I remember we sponsored that. We had it in the Jewish Urban Guerrilla newsletter and we encouraged At its to peak, it reached 18, which I remember because that's high, so we did quite well. And you got into Jewish mysticism, which was the first anyone had ever heard uh, at that point in the 60s, or most people had ever heard of Jewish mysticism. Well, you'd probably be interested in this. I became involved in Jewish mysticism uh, well, I must say that I did experiment uh, with other types of mystical okay. uh, enticing drugs before that. But I read an article by Art Green on, in the New Jews, and it was on psychedelics and Kabbalah. So I decided if I were going to get into psychedelics again, I would do it through Kabbalah. And that's when I began to study um, Kabbalistic Judaism, and I had had mystical experiences prior to that. And uh, I really got in rather intensely into that, which is very interesting because when I was at se seminary, I was a student of uh, 
not only Abraham Joshua Heschel, of course, who was mystical, but Mordechai Kaplan. Kaplan was a deist. He was, did not believe in a theistic God, a supernatural God. I was very much into Kaplanism and deism. Basically now, as I think back on it, because it was intellectually sophisticated. But in that point in my life, I was very interested in intellectual sophistication. Then I realized that wasn't really where it was at, uh, and it's hard to be a deist and be a mystic at the same time. So I got, became uh, quite involved uh, with, uh, with mystical thought. I still am. Two years before Perbrengen was formed, and probably sometime near when um, uh, the, the, gr the first alternative Chavara in Somerville, Massachusetts was formed. Chavara, Chavara. Shalom. Uh, 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 oh, Shalom, I think. I can't remember. So, uh, so you started along with Paul Redgate. Yes. Uh, Shabbat service. We 69. did. 69, so it's just two years plus before Fabrangan. Any memories of that? And is that what attracted Rob Agus, do you think? That's what attack attracted Rob Agus. And of course, what we did was, I think, rather interesting. Uh, each Shabbat had a theme, and the theme was dedicated to a particular thinker. So when we had a Heschel Shabbat, we used the writings of Heschel. We had a Kaplan Shabbat, Kaplan. Buber Shabbat, writings of Buber. We uh, had a Rosenzweig Shabbat. We did contain the road. So it was a very, uh, it was a wonderful uh, service. Held that at my home, and that that continued for quite a while. Now, when May Day happened, and I'm not. Oh, I May remember Day May Day very well. 1970. 1970. Yes. So May Day. So we were trying to think of a Jewish way of stopping traffic on May Day, and we had an all-night meeting, and Adin Steinsalz showed up. Mm -hmm. Uh, whose parents were leftist labor organizers. Right. Now, I have to say, almost no one in the room knew. There was about 60 or 70 of us in the room. No one knew who Adin Steinsaltz was, except if you were there, maybe yourself and uh, maybe David Schneer. Well, I knew very little about Adin Steinsaltz, but when I heard him speak, I realized what a genius he was yeah. and how way out he was because he uh, said, you know, everyone believes that there's not the concept of original sin in Judaism, but there is. I said, wow, I was teaching at a Catholic university. There is. Uh, and I realized, you know, how brilliant he was. So uh, that had left a deep impression upon him. Well, at that event, he was speaking way over our heads. And I remember asking him, because we needed to plan on how to block traffic right. on 16th Street. And... Um, uh, so I asked him, what, how could you distill your wisdom down to a sentence or two for us? And he didn't hesitate. He said, you're more like your parents than you think you are. That was his message, I remember. Mm. Well, May Day, what I do remember about May Day was, uh, hmm, I went to see Easy Rider uh, in the Florida, Florida Avenue Theater. And coming through um, uh, Dubon Circle, I was maced. But my house was a safe house. So I had quite a few people. Uh, in my house now, you know, it wasn't a synagogue, so I couldn't give them sanctuary, but it was pretty close to that. Do you remember uh, much about our attempt to take over Guardian Federal Savings and Loan? Yes, I remember that rather vividly. Uh, that was owned by Leo uh, uh, Bernstein, who was a very prominent Washingtonian. And uh, I remember when, where they were located on DuPont Circle. I do remember that. I remember that they were doing usurious interest for red the poor. Yeah. Red line, they wouldn't give, um, uh, they, were, they, they wouldn't give uh, mortgages to uh, people, uh, including blacks, if I remember correctly, but I remember that. The, uh, when the, um, oh, I, I did want to mention, you don't remember it, in the, were you involved in the welfare rights protests or, because we used to come to protest, local protests with signs in Hebrew from quoting. No, uh, that no. I don't okay. remember. Um, we had several retreats um, in Jews for Urban Justice, and one of them was at Harpers Ferry, and I remember you came with your two cats. I came with my two Siamese cats. I remember that very vividly. And, who uh, were climbing up the draperies. Yeah. And attracted, where they were sort of distracting, uh, but detracting. But that was okay. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, you know, we were meeting four or five days a week. 
and as a result, there were tensions, difficulties in terms of political differences. So I, I have um, a basic question, then go on to memories. Do you remember the change that happened when Arthur Waskow joined the group? I do, uh, because the group really had no political affiliation. I couldn't, wouldn't be able to find it, and so Arthur was at IPS, and it really began to have more of a new left orientation than it ever had uh, before. You know, prior to that, it was basically based on Judaism, the prophetic tradition of opposition to the establishment, etc. But then it took on more of a political character, and probably that's when we began to become involved with the politics of Israel. Because at first we were centered very much around what was happening in the Washington area. Uh, but at that time, and at that point on, there was a shift that we, we became involved in other things. Well, that, it's pivotal around the Freedom Seder. Yes. Arthur, Arthur joined when, when uh, we offered to produce the first Freedom Seder, which, which was at, well, you have memories of it. It's important to remember that the first Freedom Seder was held at um, uh, Channing Phillips, who was an African-American congregational minister at his church, which was Lincoln Temple. So the Freedom Sun, uh, the Seder was based upon the idea that there is a black theology, and the black theology is based upon the idea of God who liberates people from their slavery. So it was a unique thing. It was the first black Jewish Seder. It preceded uh, ADLs doing a black Seder. And uh, in fact, uh, next week, uh, I will be doing my 21st Black Jewish Seder at St. Uh, Martin's Catholic Church. So it had a great influence uh, upon me, and I helped uh, uh, Arthur with the liturgy for that. You, you yeah, can I just point out something? If we, yeah, I know it's hard, but maybe um, we hear the rustling if we went while he's speaking, okay. if we can minimize it maybe. Uh, you performed the early part of yes. the, the Seder and then we're joined by uh, Balfour Brickner and uh, uh, several other clergy. Uh, now what was unique are, about that Seder, because I remember that rather vividly, is that each one of us was asked to express some way in which we felt liberated during the course of the year. That was the first time I'd ever heard anyone suggest that and I realized for once the Seder was touching the minds and hearts and thoughts of people in this century rather than centuries before. I went to the second Freedom Seder too. That was at, a little at different. American University. No, that at was GW. at GW. Yeah. Um, the, um, the Seder attracted seven to eight hundred people. And, uh, and it was, and mostly alternative people, although there were mainstream people there too. Well, many of the people were people who were involved in the civil rights movement. That really was a, a significant part of it. Uh, there were several key players in Jews for Urban Justice. I'm wondering if I mentioned some of the names, if you could just say a few sentences about them. Uh, one was Charlene Krantz. I remember Charlene quite well. Uh, I remember working with her. Uh, I remember helping her re-identify as a Jew because she was quite turned off by the established Jewish community. And she said to me, if you were my rabbi growing up, I would be in a very different position. And then I had the privilege of performing her marriage. So we, we had an ongoing relationship through the years. She, of course, at an early age, was a SNCC organizer yes. in 1964 in Mississippi. Charlene worked at Politics and Prose, and I remember meeting her there, uh, because Politics and Prose was a welcome delight to the Washington area. In fact, there's nothing like Politics and Prose anywhere, not even in Manhattan. And, of course, David and his wife have done a wonderful job uh, as an independent bookstore. Charlene worked full time for JHA for at least a year. Yes. And so, do you, what memories do you have about Sharon Rose? Well, I remember Sharon Rose couldn't believe that I was a Zionist. She couldn't believe that someone was as level held as I was a, was a, was a Zionist. I mean, I was very much involved uh, in the idea uh, of uh, uh, without a Palestinian state. That was a little too early for that. But she couldn't believe that 
my credentials or my ideas would make me a Zionist. So I had to explain to her that she probably didn't have an understanding of classical Zionists. Because one of the courses that I taught, in fact, at my home, was a course on the history of the Zionist movement as a socialist movement and a, an agrarian movement, the back to nature movement. And most of the people didn't know anything about that. They didn't know anything about Akhara Am. They knew something about Herzl. So that was a very important part, explaining that Zionism in its early formation was a movement of Jewish national liberation. Uh, and that did not to judge Zionism on what we were seeing at that time. Well, of course, Sharon went on to, because she used, when she worked for JEJ, used the MERAP, Middle East Research yes. Information Project, uh, a P.O. box as the same box that she used for JEJ, right. and it, it partially had to do with the defunding of Fabrangan oh, by know. the Federation. Uh, Arno Winard, a very active member. Remember Arno, he was a Holocaust survivor, but he was one of those Holocaust survivors. He was not religious, he never was religious, but my memories of him is that the Holocaust and, the, and what he experienced and the oppression made him recognize that he had to be a beacon of light to free those who were oppressed. Uh, and his involvement with JOJ was very much based upon the fact that he was a Holocaust survivor and he really felt a categorical imperative to make certain that acts of genocide didn't occur elsewhere. Uh, Paul Rutke. Paul Rutke I remember quite well because I was involved with him because of all the people there. He was really a committed Jew. He had a spiritual orientation. Uh, he loved to pray. And so it was he and I who actually created the service uh, and uh, he conducted, in fact, part of the services. He's now, I think, ultra, ultra orthodox in Israel. Well, that's that's not unusual because Jonathan Bloom, who lived with me uh, in my home, uh, also went to Israel and became an orthodox Jew, studying Talmud and has six children, I believe, in prearranged marriage. And of course, his girlfriend uh, at the time has Eleanor. become a very prominent person. In yeah, Eleanor Epstein Jewish. was my student at American U. The first day she came, she sat on my desk and said, I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't want to be here. And I said, well, that makes two of us. Uh, so, uh, and, and Eleanor did. Uh, she went from being a mathematics major uh, to, she studied under um, Gladys Warthaut's sister, who was a famous pianist and taught at AU. Do you remember Bob and Bonnie Aptekar? Yes, uh, I do remember them. I remember them because of, from their name because it, they were, um, their name is so unusual. Now they were, the, uh, they were a couple and they were both equally involved uh, in uh, JUJ. But, and their involvement with JUJ was because they felt that as Jews, they really had an obligation to work uh, for the betterment of society out of the Jewish heritage. You know, I think they're two of the few people who had a background in Reform Judaism. Most of us they came did. from a conservative. Right, or, and including myself. Yeah. I grew up as a, in a conservative synagogue. Any memory of uh, Arnold Sternberg? Arnold Sternberg, yes, I do remember Arnold. I remember uh, he was an older member of the community. And I remember him because he would tell me stories about his parents. And I had a grandmother who lived to be 108. So we talked basically about what Jewish life was like uh, in Central and Eastern Europe and how the community, the ideas of that community, were brought to the United States. So we, we sort of bonded. When we forced the old Jewish Community Center to be open to the Poor People's Campaign, he stood at the door, you know, and along with several others of us pushing the door open. They did not want to open the doors to the Poor People's Campaign. Um, Balfour Brickner, who... I knew Balfour quite well because um, Balfour was a very, very close friend of Gene Lippmann's. And Gene Lippmann was one of the few rabbis that was involved in civil rights and the peace movement. I became the assistant rabbi at Temple Sinai. And Balfour had been the rabbi of Temple Sinai prior to Gene Lippmann's coming. And then he went on to head the rack uh, thereafter. 
So, and um, I would see Balfour, I became friendly with Balfour and his second wife. Um, and he also had a home on Martha's Vineyard, and I would visit him there. His father, of course, was a famous rabbi, Barnett Brickner, who was a very, very eminent Zionist. You know, um, uh, Gene Lippmann, uh, uh, I remember once set up a meeting uh, because Theodore Bickel wanted to meet these new leftists. Right. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, Lippmann set up a meeting with us for a whole evening with Theodore Bickel. It did not end well. And, what happened? Uh, I just remember arguments, arguments, mostly over Israel. Uh, so. Yes. Well, Gene was the rabbi, the civil rights movement, and working with the poor. He worked for Father McKenna, and he worked with Gino, Gino Baroni. And I had the privilege of not knowing McKenna, but Gino Baroni. Uh, and so I became very, very much involved, since I was at Georgetown, in Catholic programs uh, to work with the poor. Rob Agus. Rob Agus, I remember because I was, uh, I thought his father was absolutely amazing. Jacob. His father was an Orthodox rabbi, a fine scholar, who uh, was a radical thinker in the terms of his theology and became the rabbi of Bethel. Uh, in Bethesda. So I remember when uh, Rob Agus uh, first came to the community, and that was before uh, the, the Fabrengen was created, because Rob was one of the people who was the transition between JUJ and Fabrengen. Do you uh, have any memories of Isaac Frank, who was our nemesis? Uh, Isaac before? Frank and I were actually good friends. I knew Isaac Frank because uh, he, be, after he, he retired from academic teaching, he came to Georgetown. In fact, I got him the job. And he became the Jewish presence uh, at uh, the Kennedy Center for Bioethics. So he and I became quite close because of the Georgetown Association. He and I taught a seminar uh, at uh, Georgetown. Isaac was a fine scholar. He, his knowledge of, uh, of Spinoza was absolutely amazing. He, however, um, was responsible for my being kicked off the Jewish Community Council. Oh. Yes. I was probably the only person actually kicked off for the Jewish Community Council because I missed two meetings. Now, I never, never heard of anyone missing two meetings and being evicted uh, from a board. I was probably evicted, too, because I didn't have a lot of money. And, you know, I don't, I'm very careful about becoming board members now because what they expect you to do is make major contributions, and raise money. I'm not into that. You know, Arthur and I were both on an urban affairs committee of the Jewish Community Council. And uh, I remember Arthur's face, uh, you know, wide open, uh, as was Isaac Frank's, when we decided, I decided to leave. And we poured in a whole bunch of old laundry at the meeting and saying, you're not interested really in associating with blacks. You're interested in... Uh, Shmata for the Schwarze program. Uh, right. Uh, uh, Charlene Kranz, uh, Sharon Rose, and myself poured the dirty laundry right. and left. Well, one thing I can share with you is that having been at uh, Michigan, I realized one thing. Ath academics aren't necessarily liberal. In fact, I saw the change um, occur in 1967 uh, when it was the academics who opposed my involvement in the civil rights movement because they said blacks are going to replace us. This was when Commentary and no Norman Podhoretz went to the right. So it wasn't surprising to me that Isaac, who was a great scholar, was conservative politically. And, you know, f 47 years at Georgetown, I can tell you, that being an academic does not necessarily mean that it will move you to liberal thought in terms of political life. Well, some of our clashes happen yes. because of us coming out of the new, the new lab, right. civil rights, uh, SDS, and these people still being stuck in the 50s and the Eisenhower era. Um, so in terms of national events, uh, again, I remember you and your two Siamese cats at the founding uh, National Jewish Radner, Organizing. Radnor, Pennsylvania. Any memories of that? Because that was the first 
national gathering of Jews on the left. I remember that because I remember that we had seminars. We broke into seminars, and that was very impressive. Uh, and it was just a keynote speaker and the type of thing that I was used to from rabbinical assembly, conventions, etc. But we broke into seminars, and that was very, very impressive. It was so well organized, and I remember that very, very well. Um, trying to think of some Ar of the people. Arnold Jacob Wolf. Yes, was Everett. there Arnold Jacob Wolf? Everett Gendler. Everett Gendler, and those are people I already I knew from the rabbinate. Uh, uh, people who were dissenters in the Jewish community yes. already. I have a whole, I have the whole list. I just don't have it in front of me. But it was uh, da uh, Daniel S Daniel Siegel. Uh, Daniel Siegel. One thing that's the very, rabbi Daniel yeah, Siegel. One of the things that's along. very important to bear in mind is why I was able to do this because I was an employee for, of Georgetown. I worked for Georgetown. And the reason Georgetown paid my salary and still pays my salary is that Georgetown did not want me to be hampered by the politics of the Jewish community. And the president of Georgetown said to me definitively, uh, I want you to be free to express your ideas on any subject. If they are controversial in the Jewish community, I will stand by you. So I had the benefit that other people didn't because people who were working for Hillel, who were paid by B'nai B'rith, were hampered by conservative members of the community. You were kind of an intermediary in terms of these outlandish things we were doing, participating in it, and making accusations about the lack of involvement in social justice. Uh, were you able to pick up anything positive or or in some way, for instance, when we, there was this other incident of us trying to disrupt the High Holy Day service at, at Addis Tiferes, Israel. Or Addis. Addis, yeah. Right. Well, you know, I understand the position of my colleagues. I was not a congregational rabbi. If I did the things that I did as a congregational rabbi, I would have been fired. I knew that. And they had to weigh their significance. What was more important, their service to the community and a vibrant Judaism, or being fired? Uh, and they chose the former rather than the latter. So I understand where they were coming from. Uh, a number of them said to me, would say to me, you can do it, we can't. If you do it, you won't be fired by Georgetown. In fact, you'll be admired by Georgetown. They're Jesuits, we won't. But I don't, you know, in terms of the traditional social justice groups, American Jewish Committee, American Jewish Congress, B'nai B'rith, Anti-Defamation League, none of them would, would touch us in terms because of... Because they were organizations and they depended upon funding. And if you want funding in the Jewish community, you have to create a crisis. And the crisis uh, might not, usually is not about a, a, a liberal cause. Also understand that Reform Judaism uh, patterned itself after the prophets. It called itself prophetic Judaism. That is why it was the reform rabbis who were involved in the civil rights movement, who were involved in the war protest, rather than conservative and certainly orthodox rabbis. The only conservative rabbi or member of the, of the seminary faculty who was involved was Abraham Joshua Heschel. And you may recall that in, in protesting the war, he carried a Torah uh, into uh, Arlington Cemetery and was cr criticized for bringing Torah into a cemetery where non-Jews were buried. When we, uh, when we had the um, uh, National Jewish Movement Center at the mobilization against the war, uh, 1971 or 1971? 1971. So um, we, out of a sense of obligation, invited Al Horspan, who at that point headed up the reform movement right. national. And, uh, uh, we only did it, really, because Balfour Bruckner and perhaps you suggested we do it. I did. Um, and then we also invited Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman. <laughs> and, of course, Jerry Rubin had uh, Abby Hoffman. That, you know, people know who Abby Hoffman was. But uh, one of them, I think it was Jerry Rubin, advocated killing your parents. Uh, figuratively, of figuratively, course. Figuratively, right. Uh, and I remember Vorspand uh, uh, sent me a uh, telegram saying, I'm sorry, I cannot... Be, I well, cannot talk to a group of... You have to understand the background of that. Uh, in the Torah of the 613 mitzvah, only two have a promise of a physical reward. One is honor your uh, parents, and the second one is 
honoring the mother of a bird and not taking the egg away from the presence of the bird. Also, uh, I, was, I recommended Boris Spam because I, re I read his book on Judaism and social justice. And it was a great book. It was the only book that came out at its time which actually rooted social justice in the Jewish tradition. So I thought that was a good bet. But again, we were in our early 20s. You were 10 years older then. I would have been yeah, 30. As was Arthur. I was 35. So you, were, you and Arthur are about the same age. Uh, but we were of that uh, SDS, Freedom Summer, Congress of Racial Equality generation. And uh, uh, these people had a different, these were uh, survivors of uh, Eisenhower and House American a Activities meeting and uh, FBI and informants. Uh, we, also, we didn't know about it. I also remember we were formed while Washington was burning as a result of the riots. Many Jewish businessmen were burned out mm -hmm. uh, of their places, their business places, and they became very anti-black. So this was a very difficult period for the Jewish community. And that's when the migration out of the city began. I mean, I lived in Q Street, DuPont Circle. I could count the number of Jews who lived in my area on the, yeah. probably on the fingers of two hands, and that was it. So the People's Peace Treaty, uh, we uh, had a, a separate uh, declared a peace between uh, the Jews of America and the Viet Cong and uh, North Vietnamese, and we, I took a year off from work to organize around it. And Heschel joined, you were involved yes. as part of the project, um, and, uh, and we raised money to uh, reforest parts of Vietnam and to sign a peace treaty with them, and which I was involved in when I, when I went to Paris. But any memories of that? And that well, you know, I became involved in it because I uh, had studied the life of Ho Chi Minh. Uh, and I realized that he had sent letters to Woodrow Wilson telling him why the uh, League of Nations would fail, and that as a student uh, at the Sorbonne, uh, he greatly admired America. America. He based the Constitution of Vietnam uh, on uh, the Constitution of the U.S. And in 1961, I was in Saigon, and I heard David Schumacher, I think, a CBS correspondent speaking about the upcoming war, and I realized we were backing the wrong people, and I realized we would lose. I was a Navy chaplain at the time. I loved uh, the Navy. I loved the chaplaincy, but I knew that I would be court-martialed uh, if I stayed. So it was the study of Ho Chi Minh and his life that gave me the idea, the realization that we were dead wrong on that war. We, of course, planted a tree in, at uh, Congressional Hill. Yes, I was there. Number, you were there. There's a picture Brown of me with, with sideburns. I look like a hippie. And, uh, and that tree is no longer there. I think it died. It was a cherry tree. Or yes, it was a cherry tree. I've tried George to. Washington cut it down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, you've just raised a brief memory, uh, and I'm not sure if it's true, uh, of your also being um, a chaplain at a, um, a prison, and the Purple Gang, the, the Purple Gang, of the pur Purple Gang, right. were decided to to keep kosher. Yes, and you were the rabbi. That's for, a wonderful story. Yeah, I went there, and uh, they what said we're going to give year? you uh, 1967, 66. They said we're going to give you a tour of the prison. Uh, I said, well, that'll be interesting. He said we're going to take you to the various chapels. So we went to the Catholic chapel, crucifix, the Protestant chapel. No crucifix, what was the chapel? And I said, take me to the synagogue. Well, they took me to the kitchen. That was, that was the synagogue, the kitchen. And these old guys were cooking up a storm. These were murderers and Murderers, the Purple Gang, and the yeah. Purple Gang. Yeah. And they said, do you know Yiddish? I said, not very much. So they began speaking Yiddish to me. And the, then we played a game of chess. And then they started talking and they said to me, Ain't like the good old days, Rabbi. Back then, we used to take our uh, machine guns and go, rat -a -tat -a -tat, you're dead. Uh, but these were nice old Jewish men. Now, that's how I got into Siamese cats. They gave me a Siamese cat uh, as a gift. I took the Siamese cat home. The Siamese cat had only known men. So in my apartment, a woman uh, walked in, and the Siamese cat attacked the woman because it had been an all-male environment. 
Those are good bread, good memories, interesting ones. You know, the final, the final piece is the transition from Jews to urban justice into Fabrani. So, um, so the merged. Uh, I don't know if you remember anything about uh, some of the early teachers. I mean, oh, you, you I taught know. there. I as do did, remember. Uh, uh, as did uh, Mark Gelman, Shlomo Karlbach, Shlomo Karlbach, came and taught at Mel the Gelman. So, do you have any memories? Yeah, about the it? idea of it was, and it was my dream and vision, uh, that Judaism is a civilization. In fact, twelve years ago, I was the founder of the Center for Jewish Civilization at Georgetown presenting Judaism as a religion, a nation, and a people. So the idea of the, um, of the Fabrengen was the idea of the new Jews, like the Jewish catalog. We have offered classes in almost everything, how to make yarmulkes, how to tie the tzitzit on a talit, as well as the cl classic study. So that's how it began, and it began, and we rented that townhouse in, on Florida Avenue next to uh, the uh, Cosmos Club. Cosmos. Right. Now, uh, the thing was that there was a spy from the Jewish community. I re remember her name, but I'm Lenore Siegel. Lenore. I will tell you her name. And she attended a class that I taught on Jeremiah. And she reported to the uh, UJA, the Federation Board, that I turned Jeremiah into a member of Fatah and that I was a member of Fatah and a supporter of Fatah. Okay. And I'll never forget that. And that was, but those were the reports that were being carried. They, they placed plants in our classes to report what we were teaching. Uh, believe me, I, he was, Jeremiah was a, he was a radical. But to make that parallel, oh, was rather silly. You know, that reminds me, uh, David Schneer, who was very instrumental, joined JUJ and then very much a part of, of uh, uh, forming for bringing in any memories then of David? Yes, I remember David coming in. He came in fr fresh from R Rutgers uh, with a great deal of enthusiasm. I remember that he had this Pied Piper, uh, Pied Piper uh, sort of personality. I do remember that. But I saw that for Brengen eventually would become, move away from a political ideology, I knew that, and would basically become a Chavara which is what it became, um, and, but it was a wonderful thing. It was, it was wonderful because there were many Jews who were not synagogue affiliated or who didn't like the religious school, so the Verbergen Theater began. And uh, I think it was a great dream and a vision, and of course it's lasted. Though it's a very different entity than what it was back then. I mean, back then, the idea was that it would be a civilization, not just a synagogue. And uh, of course, it's the character of it has changed, but it's lasted. Oh, it's lasted. It's still around. And, right. Uh, you could even make a jump saying a lot of the people who were active in JUJ and for Brangen infused and mm -hmm. changed synagogues they like did. TI and Otis. And right. And Margie Siegel, I think, was the president of yes, she of, was of Otis Israel. Uh, and uh, well, any other. Uh, I'm wondering if there's, you know, the only other thing I'm thinking is for Brangen um, was very famous for his open High Holy Day services at, at uh, Press. Well, you weren't involved in your own High Holy Day no, services. No, uh, but the, the interesting thing about that was that we were the only, I was the only um, college entity that didn't charge seats for the High Holiday and was open to all. And before Beit Mishpacha was formed as a gay synagogue, the member, the, there weren't members, the, the gay community used to come to my services. Uh, and I was criticized by rabbis for the fact that I wasn't charging and that Jews who would have gone to their synagogues were coming to me because of the fact that it was free. The reality is that without charging for tickets, free will offerings, I raised enormous amounts of money from people who appreciated that fact. But I got a lot of crap from the local rabbis saying I was taking people away from their synagogues. But, you, know. you know, this is a broad generalization, but prior to JUJ and then early for Brangen, I don't think the vision of Judaism was something other than a four holiday a year. You know, we presented the concept of a Jewish counterculture and something 
um, which he wanted to get back to, the concept of Judaism not as a religion, but as Am, Am Yisrael and B'nai Yisrael, mm -hmm. the, the tribal and national concepts. And that was foreign to the thinking of mainstream Judaism, I think, by the 1960s. Well, I think we're faced with the two alternatives. One is tribalism, and the other is what I would uh, call communion or uh, um, a, a, an idea of uh, acceptance. And what I see happening, of course, in Israel elections is tribalism. And tribalism is something that I fought uh, almost you know, all of my conscious life. I think it's, it's evil. I think it's wrong. Uh, we're a covenantal religion. And so the future has to really be that dedication, that rededication to the idea of covenant. And of course, my ideas are very shaped by the fact that I've been at Georgetown all those years. I mean, my most popular course is Jesus the Jew, or a Jewish understanding of the New Testament. And I'm the co-director of the Interfaith Family Project. Um, I think one thing that would be interesting, because people wonder, how is a conservative rabbi that I ever do interfaith marriages get into that? And I'll share that story with you, because I think it tells you something about me. A couple came to see me, uh, and they uh, told me a horrible story. They told me the story that they went to see a rabbi, and the rabbi said to them, the uh, woman was Irish Catholic, what Hitler didn't complete, you will complete. And I was just horrified. I was so horrified by that, that I shared it with Father Healy, who was the president of Georgetown at that time. And he said to me, Harold, you have a categorical imperative to do their marriage, to atone for what your colleague said. And that was the first interfaith marriage that I did because I began to, to realize I saw the handwriting on the wall I, I, uh, many, many years ago, back in the early 70s. So now, colleagues who wouldn't speak to me are now calling me and saying to me, help us, help us deal with this. I knew it was coming, but believe me, I was a pariah. I was a leper in this community. But you know what? I survived because my life really has been my life at Georgetown, JOJ, all those different things. Could you recall uh, some prominent, now we're, we're at the Institute for Policy Studies right now, and it was just recalled that uh, the Moffats were yes. married by you. You have that and other memories of important Ronnie marriage. Moffat, Ronnie Carpin, um, used to come to see me uh, for preparation. Uh, and Orlando Letale, uh, of course, uh, and she were very, very close. She came to see me, and this is really ironic, because they were assassinated in her car. And she made a statement to me, she said, I shouldn't be driving a German car, I guess. It was a VW. Wow. And it was the car that was blown up. But I did her marriage, I knew Michael very, very well, and her, her death occurred exactly three months after her marriage. And I remained friendly with the Carpens for a long time. In fact, I used to come to the, uh, the, the programs at Sheridan Circle, the annual event, and I haven't been to that for a long time. So I should really be on the mailing list because I saw, feel sort of, uh, you know, I went to Q Street to find IPS, <laughs> but now that I find you, you're stuck with me. <laughs> now, any other marriages that stand out uh, on the left? Well, I did Marcus Raskin's oh. second marriage. His first wife didn't like the fact that I did it. Um, and then I've done weddings on the right. Uh, of One of the people who, who loves me is Ari Fleischer. I'm his rabbi. Uh, also, let's see, the people who came to Georgetown service. Barney Frank used to come to Georgetown services. Uh, some very famous uh, uh, people. But you didn't marry? Uh, no, I didn't. I wasn't invited to do that marriage. I, did, I wasn't invited to do that, uh, that marriage. You know, there was a very famous Jewish historian that used to come, I don't know why, to Ferengen High Holy Day services, who, uh, um, Sharma. Uh, oh, um, Sarner? Sarner. Yeah. And I always remember him. Sarner, he was very famous. He was the librarian at, J at JTS. And I had no idea why he would 
come to our services when he was The most about. famous personality, however, that I met at Georgetown was Pearl Bailey. She, became, she was my student. I did Pearl Bailey's funeral. Now, I must tell you right. something about that, because that has an interesting twist to it. She asked that I do her funeral, even though she wasn't Jewish. Uh, Jesse Jackson appeared, and he came up to the pulpit of this huge church, and he said to me, why are you doing this funeral? She wasn't Jewish. No, she despised him. And I said, because she requested it. Well, he was becoming quite nasty about that. Cab Calloway threw him off the stage, off the puppet. I do remember that very, very vividly. You know, uh, Bruce Goldman, I don't know if you knew Bruce yes. Goldman, but he, of course, was the Hillel rabbi. It was fired at Columbia when Columbia. they took over. And they had to take over, and he started driving cabs for a living. But he called us and asked us if he would, uh, we would join with them uh, in a pulpit takeover at uh, Washington Hebrew. Any members of that? Or? I do really remember that. Of course, Washington Hebrew has become a very different place. It was a classical reform temple. You couldn't wear a yarmulke. You couldn't wear a prayer shawl. Uh, they wouldn't even call the cantor a cantor. They called the cantor the uh, baritone soloist. They didn't observe festivals other than Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. The uh, rabbi Gersenfeld was called the Jewish Pope. But I brought his daughter to JUJ, in fact. So she I got, got her involved. I got her involved in Norma. J Norma, yes. Uh, so, you know, it was a very, very different place at that time. Uh, politically, I don't think it's any different than it was then. It's just much more traditional, uh, Jewishly, uh, than it was. The only synagogue that really had any semblance of social activism is um, the uh, Adachalon, the Reconstructionist Synagogue. However, the Jewish community became very, very much involved in shelters and street village. In fact, I just went to the memorial service for John Steinbrook. And so that they've done very well. Almost every major synagogue sponsors a house for battered women. Any other closing thoughts about Jews for Urban Justice? Uh, you know, this is largely, I mean, we have archival information, but this is the first time we've ever even spoken about it. Well, my, my pain is that people don't have passion for causes anymore. Um, I mean, I grew up with passion for causes. I don't see young people having that passion. Um, there isn't even among students the passion for Israel. Um, and so I think we live in a very different time, you know. Um, I've uh, worked for 53 years, I never worried about a job. Never worried about a job. Young people now worry about jobs. It's a very, very different world, a very dark world. That's from my point of view. I'm glad I'm going to be 83. I don't have to be around too much longer. But your memory is that uh, the JOJ people were filled with passion. They were filled with passion and they were willing to take the first step. I always remember the, the lovely Midrash, I think it's in this, that um, the children of Israel stepped into the Red, Red Sea onto the dry land. Well, how could you step into the sea into the dry land? No, they had the faith that the miracle would occur before it occurred. They could have been drowned, so they took the step forward, even though it might have been in their death. So I think we've lost that to a great degree. So I'll end with that, I think that. But you know, uh, Rosenzweig speaks of the redemptive power of collective memory. So what we're doing here is very important, that people read about it and know about it and somehow, will somehow develop uh, a passion. Uh, what will that passion be for? Well, if it's not for the environment and ecology, then we're lost. So. You know, I went to the founding meeting of uh, Jews United for Justice. Yes. Very different group. Yes. But still uh, passionate younger people. Yeah, you know, I give them money and I get their emails. But I get so many emails, quite frankly. I'm emailed out. Hey, thank you very much. Well, you're very welcome. Glad I could do this for you.